I hope you enjoyed our previous talk as much as I did. And now I'd like to welcome David Cortiers from the Arduino Foundation. And he will, well, <laughs> just David Cortiers, and he will talk about Arduino, Internet of Things, uh, open hardware and lot, and so on and so on. So I hope you enjoy the presentation, and we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. Thank you. I will say we, we are not the foundation. That was I was saying, like, no, no, no. We try to be a foundation, but the overhead of banking foundation is too much. We prefer to give job to people. So we are a company. So uh, I'm here today, and I represent a whole lot of different people. I, uh, I make this steady joke that I'm like a Formula One rider. So I, if you want to take a picture of me with all my sponsors, I will pose. OK, good. That's about it. So. Um, I work for Malmo University in Sweden. I'm a research fellow at Malmo University. And uh, I am part of the Arduino team. I'm one of the Ar Arduino founders. Uh, it's mandatory to have some degree of beard in your life at some point. And um, I also have like a studio together with some former students of mine where we have a lot of fun and do projects like everybody else. Uh, nothing for money, by the way. But today, today here, I'm. I'm here to talk about Arduino, and I'm here to basically present uh, the workshop we're going to be running today and tomorrow. And uh, so I will just first give you a brief introduction to Arduino. I assume that many of you know already what Arduino is. And uh, luckily, I don't see so many faces that are repeated from other talks. So I, I think I can tell you the same old jokes without having to be too creative, which is good. <coughs> So for many people, Arduino is just a blue circuit board, like the one up here. Okay? And uh, for real, Arduino is nothing but the blue circuit board. But the issue is that when you want to use this blue circuit board, you need to have a lot of things around it. And, you know, it's, a, it's a computer, but a, a computer is nothing without software and a way to produce new software. That's like the, uh, the ba very basic of any free and open source project. So this computer that per se is already uh, open because you can take all its design and reuse it, has a software development environment where you can write code for it. And one of the key issues that made Arduino successful, at least in my eyes, is that this development environment runs on every computer, more or less. So it runs on, obviously, Windows computers that are 70% of the computers used in the world. It runs on Linux computers that take about 15% of the share. And it runs on Mac computers. And even runs on Mac computers running Linux, like this one, which is like a minimal amount of people in the world that really like trouble. And then on top of that, we have all the documentation around the hardware and the software available for free and with a license that allows you to replicate it, reuse it. Uh, sell it and profit out of it. So this is what Arduino is. And when we set up this ecosystem with these three legs, the first thing that happened is that people started to talk about it everywhere else but at our website. So we decided to set up a forum for people to come and discuss about Arduino on our own website. And that created a very rich community of users. Uh, we have over 100,000 registered users. Of s some of them are obviously bots, but you know, I'm not going to enter to judge. Uh, they're there, they're happy. <clears throat> so the Arduino community of users is a, is a very special type of community of people that are willing to learn not just about software, but also about hardware. They invest their time, they invest their effort, they like to get burned, they like paying quite a lot, and, and they like to experience uh, new types of things. <clears throat> when you ask me, or when people ask me where Arduino users are coming from, I mean, your users are coming from all over the world, but they are us for today, mostly coming from two places, which is North America, which is 90% the US, because those are a lot of people that really like to experiment, and Europe. Europe takes right now about 46% of the share of the Arduino community. And uh, it's very interesting because if you think about it, Europe is a really mixed area. It's a lot of people that speak a lot of different languages, not just uh, English. And that's very, at the very core of the Arduino development, we try to focus on 
uh, working with many different cultures and many different translation systems, which is actually not very easy. <clears throat> then again, who are the Arduino team? Well, the Arduino team are, are a bunch of geeks. Um, this is us, a couple of years ago, when we had a bit more hair. And uh, basically, this is Dave, Gianluca, Tom, Massimo, myself, and it's missing Daniela. Uh, we have actually a six member in the team, but since Daniela is working very close with Gianluca, they never travel together, so they can never really post together in the picture. You know, it's like, uh, it's very important, so somebody stays at the factory making sure things work, you know. <clears throat> so let's go back to the story. So we have the Arduino board, and this particular design has been distributed in a pretty large amount all around the world. You know, it's like uh, the, one of the one of the interesting factors, one of the interesting things behind Arduino is that it's one of the first successful open source hardware projects, and. As you see, I'm not saying it's not the first one. I'm not saying it's the first successful one. I'm saying it's one of the first successful ones. And it's the first one that has been cloned over 100 times. I mean, that I can say for sure. You know, if, if you go on eBay, you can buy like 50 different types of clones coming from a whole bunch of different factories in all over the world, mostly China, uh, that are basically having the similar, similar functionality to ours or same functionality as ours. <clears throat> And when it comes to the usage, we register the usage of the boards via our website. And we see that there are many more users than boards. We see we have about 1 million unique users every month. And we only have about 600,000 boards out there. I think that says quite a lot about how this uh, platform allows users that are using hardware that is not our hardware necessarily. So openness is not just about letting people copy your stuff is also about letting people collaborate with you and somehow contribute back. Now, it wouldn't be the first time that we see a derivative design from Arduino that actually feeds the system back. But <clears throat> there is much more to Arduino than just one single board. There is a whole ecosystem of different boards that people are designing and are contributing back to, uh, to the system, making the whole thing grow. But there is one common characteristic that is very important, that, uh, and it is that the Arduino platform itself is hardware agnostic. You know, you, we are not dependent on one single chip manufacturer. We can easily shift from one manufacturer to a different manufacturer. Uh, until now, we have been focusing on one single chip manufacturer because it was very easy to develop our, our core. But now we are shifting towards, others, uh, towards other manufacturers and um, and as well as other form factors. And the important aspect is that we have created a hardware abstraction layer that can be used in a very easy way over different hardware platforms. <clears throat> okay, but which is our vision? Our vision is essentially, at, as for now, our vision is to help people learn about digital electronics the easiest way possible. So ideally, you would take the latest piece of technology and apply it over a physical object and allow people to program it and reuse it, and so back and so forth. So this particular design you see here is a robot that is an open source hardware robot that I designed for uh, Mexican kids that is made of parts that you can find in Mexico City, and it costs only 40 euros to manufacture. And it's, um, I mean, you could see it on this video, for example. So the idea behind this project for me was to create a, create a robot that could easily be replicated. And I didn't have to build everything from scratch. I could reuse the whole software behind Arduino. I could use the whole documentation existing about how to use motors or how to program circuit boards and so on. And I could, in just one month, go from an idea to have a full workshop to educate, educate uh, a class with up to 99 kids in robotics. We manufactured 11 robots and donated them to this uh, school in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're trying to achieve. It does not necessarily have to go through our own boards. It can happen through boards that other people manufacture. We just create reference designs, and we're even making our own boards cheaper if that's necessary to reach this mission. But today I'm here to talk about 
uh, other projects and as well as uh, to talk about the Internet of Things. So first I'm going to show you a couple of examples of projects that you might or not find funny. So since we're in Germany, I want to start with this project made by a German student in architecture. And I'm saying that he's a German student in architecture, not because he's German, but because he studied architecture. And he came to my school. And my school is not an engineering school. I teach at an art school. So he came to learn something about Swedish design. And he ended up in my lab, where we teach electronics for designers and artists. I know it's a pretty complicated mix. So I have this German architecture student coming to Sweden to learn design, ending up at a lab where we teach electronics for designers. So he went bananas. I guess, uh, you know, it was far too many words in one single sentence. So he wanted to make a virtual reality helmet to get isolated from reality. Uh, and he made this helmet. And in just one day, he built this very nice helmet that was taking sound from the environment and making visuals. Inside this helmet, he made a small screen with a lot of LEDs that were shifting colors in front of his eyes. The, the thing is that making the proof of concept this is a proof of concept. With Arduino, it's very easy. It goes very quick. It takes about a couple of hours. And I think it's very important to reach that level of proof of concept very easily because it encourages you to continue. And there is a very important aspect behind learning that is you need to have you know, a clear roadmap where you have small points where you are succeeding every time. So you get encouraged to continue learning. But uh, in this case, Melvin is his name. He didn't give up. So he made the whole thing into a full helmet that would allow you to navigate the space in a different way. It was transforming the distance to the walls or to objects into sound and the sound in the room into visuals. So it was giving some sort of like synesthetic effect. It was cross-matching your senses. Um, and I always make this joke and I always say that when a security guard at, a, at an art center that is there every day keeps on using your helmet every night is because it's a very nice helmet. Or his life is really, really boring, which is like... So there is a lot of derivative projects coming from Arduino, and one of them, one of the most successful ones, and uh, I'm actually kind of proud to have been invited to have a speech with the creator of the RepRap. The, you know, RepRap is probably the most interesting and thrilling project right now in the world of physical manufacturing. And its, it's hardware, from the very beginning, runs on a derivative board from Arduino. It's programmed with the Arduino software, and it, it allows you to share the firmware of the circuit boards and you know, create better versions out of it. <clears throat> and then finally, when talking about robotics, I wanted to show you this robot for real, but I'm very unlucky with traveling lately, so my suitcase gets lost every time. So this is the so-called Arduino robot. That is a robot that's been designed by two kids from Madrid who are four times world champions in robotic soccer at the RoboCup uh, in the junior category, obviously. And uh, this is going to be an educational robot. And I haven't really mentioned anything about money, but one very important aspect for us in Arduino is that we try to make things as cheap as possible. So this, uh, the, one of the main design aspects behind this robot was that it has to have everything that you can have, like a color screen and buttons and a small joystick and everything, and it has to be less than 100 euros. So I can tell you that it's been two years, and uh, now we are very close to release this thing. Uh, and we think, I think we're going to achieve that price, which is pretty interesting. Because obviously, once we put it out there for that price, the cloners are going to make it for 10% less, 20% less, so we'll be forced to make it even better and even cheaper. So it's going to be a nice, nice thing to compete in. But I, I'm going to show you something funny. This is going to be probably my last video on things people do. But I'd really like to show this video. I don't know how many of you have seen this. I'm not sure we're having sound from the computer. Is there sound? You hear? The audience is getting no sound. Okay. I'm spoiling the fan, so I'm going to pause it here. Shall we try again?
Okay, I want to show this mostly because of coolness factor. I mean, if you are interested in sports and not so much in electronics, now you should know you can hug your shoes and make them sound nice. But um, this is obviously an ad from Nike for Nike Plus. So if you like, you, you can get this video on YouTube. It's been there forever now. And uh, at the end, you get this Nike Free Run Plus. Okay, so I'm, I'm just making a product placement right now in front of you guys. You know, geeks and sports don't really match together. Just think about it. Uh, but anyway, the idea is that uh, behind that project is Daito Manabe, which is a Japanese artist. And in, inside every shoe, there is an Arduino mini board uh, that communicates to a computer. And inside each shoe, there is a bunch of sensors. And there is another video I'm not going to show you that is the making of this video, and I encourage you to look for it, because they make a very long explanation on how they're looking for the right way of attacking the instrument. Because in the end, this shoe becomes a music instrument. And musicians, they usually have a very de deterministic relationship to the instrument. So they, they want the sensors to behave in a certain way, so that every time they make the same gesture, the thing behaves the same way and makes the same type of sound. So, <clears throat> but let's move. Let's shift to the next topic, which is the Internet of Things, which is the reason why I'm here today. Uh, because within Arduino, we've been analyzing different topics that we think are strategic, that are important for the future. Obviously, education is a very important subject, and I'm mostly committed to work within the education field. But we have to, we also work with the idea of connected objects. And as, I don't know if you know this memo from Sony Ericsson, oh, sorry, Ericsson Research that says that there will be 50 billion connected devices in the world. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever seen the video of the social web of things where there is this guy that's going to come home and then all his objects phones are to talk to each other because he's sad because his girlfriend dumped him for the night. So the, the objects make him dinner and the whole thing. And they talk on Facebook. You know, like the coach says, so oh, I'm going to go cozy for you. And the vacuum cleaner goes around, vacuum cleaning the apartment. And OK, we should take a look at that video. but. I mean, that, that idea is a bit extreme. Personally, I don't think my vacuum cleaner is going to be talking to my microwave oven. But I do believe that there is a lot of different situations where it's important to have connected objects and objects that talk to each other and share data and so on. So within Arduino, we, we thought that would be interesting to explore that field in order to offer people a very quick way into prototyping. <clears throat> so first of all, I, I try to look always for ways to explain people about what things are. So let me try to explain you what I think the Internet of Things is from the perspective of my grandmother, which is the best example I could always find. My grandmother turned 84 a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she is not really aware of the temperature outside. I mean, she lives in a ninth floor in an apartment block, and from her place is always sunny. Zaragoza, my hometown, has only 50 days of clouds a year. So it could be minus 10, but it could be sunny. So that's, that's really a problem. You know, usually you open the window, you put out your arm like this, and you think, ooh, it's chilly. But you know, at 84, you stop doing that. So you just go out. So I always thought it would be really cool if she could have a clock that connected to the internet and could tell her, dude, it is minus 10, you should probably get a jacket, or you should probably stay home. And Well, you might say, well, we have this. This solves this problem directly. Have you tried to give your grandmother a cell phone? I mean, I, I tried to give my mother a cell phone, and that was complicated enough. So I'm not going to enter. I, I gave my dad an iPhone a couple of weeks ago, and we're still discussing about how to connect it to the internet. So. So, so the idea behind the alarm clock for my grandmother is, OK, she had really understands the alarm clock. She, she has had an alarm clock her whole life. This thing could just hook to the internet, check Yahoo weather or whatever, and tell her directly, not even tell her this is the temperature, to tell her, get your jacket now. No, you're going to the park, get your jacket now. Or it's too hot, leave your jacket home, because that's the other one. You know, it's like 45 degrees in the summertime, and she goes out with her black jacket, you know, covered to the neck. So, so, but now think about it. How can you actually make this? You need something that connects to the internet. You think, oh, I have DSL home. No, she doesn't have DSL home. You know, 
She needs something that hooks up to the internet by itself, that requires zero configuration, and that is you know, aware of possible errors and can behave the right way. And that's, for me, the Internet of Things. That's the realm we have to think about, you know, where the users really don't have to think about where the connectivity happens. So, but in order to make this clock, I basically needed to work over a cell phone network. I needed to connect to the Internet. I need to be able to buy in it. And now comes another problem. As you know, when you buy whatever connected object, you need to register with your, with your ID card. You know, you need to register it because of uh, security reasons. You cannot just buy, well, in Sweden you can buy a cash card, but in Spain you cannot even buy a cash card for your phone without, uh, you know, presenting your ID card. And then the data expires. Now think about it. How much does one gigabyte of data cost nowadays? In Vodafone in Spain it costs 19 euros. But it expires in one month. This alarm clock needs one gigabyte to work the next 10 years. My grandmother will be dead by then. You know, I would be happy to pay the 19 euros if they gave me one card that will work over 10 years with one gigabyte. But there is no phone operator that gives you that connectivity. Data expires in their eyes. The funny thing is that data gets cheaper and cheaper every day. You know, it's this kind of, it's this kind of valuta that makes no sense to, to keep for long because it gets cheaper. So it, it's like the euro right now. Yes, spend all your euros. They're getting cheaper by dollars. Okay, but there is one device that actually does that and it's completely transparent to the user and it's the Kindle. The Kindle connects to the network and it downloads books for you and you don't get a monthly fee on how much data you were spending on this Kindle thing. You know, you subscribe, you give your ID card the first day, and then it's for you, and it's there. And you are not aware on how much data you're using on it. You pay every time you get a book, and you don't even notice. You know, the thing is that Amazon is a really big com company, and they can easily sign the deals. But any of you, as a small hardware manufacturer, you cannot sign the deal with whatever phone operator to make 10,000 alarm clocks for my grandmother. I mean, she just needs one. Come on, guys, make me one. You know, this is the, this is the issue. This is the, one of the big problems for this. <clears throat> so, but let's look at some objects connected to the Internet of Things made with Arduino. And I, I really like this picture, and I know that Mad Dog likes this picture because this guy is wearing the Debian T-shirt. He's 14, by the way. Or he was 14 when he made this project. As in, it's an earthquake alarm system that tweets there is an earthquake. So he took a vibration sensor that exists is a commercial thing, and he hacked it. Uh, they usually have a relay to place whatever alarm or whatever, and he used that as an input to an Arduino Ethernet shield, and this goes online and tweets, hey, there is an earthquake in Santiago de Chile. No? I'm subscribed to his Twitter feed. I think we are over 30,000 people right now, and it's very funny. He, he, he writes sometimes, guys, this is a test. Don't get scared. And then he sends the tweet message, just to make sure the thing keeps on working. That's a very interesting thing. That's an example on how an Internet of Things device should work. It should tell you, hello, I'm making a test because I'm always connected. So don't get panicked, but I have to check that there is an earthquake at some point. You know, I need to be sure this thing works. Well, this is a very funny project, which is the Botanicals. And it's a, it's a, it's a product you can buy, but I see it more as a critique to the society we live in. How many of you have plants home? All of you. I'm not talking about those plants that you smoke, okay? I'm because usually people that plant plants that they smoke, they really take care of those plants. I'm talking about like flowers, you know, a cactus, you know. Okay, how many of your plants die every year? Like, right now my plants are dead because I've been away for two weeks and then um, Okay, the idea behind botanicals is not that they water your plants automatically, it's that it tweets, I'm getting dry here. You know, you put this in your plant and it's telling you, dude, you better come water me up. <clears throat> Again, this was prototyped with Arduino and then it was shaped in the form of a leaf and just tweets over the Ethernet, you know. It again requires that you are connected and so on and so forth. And it's something that's always connected. You saw the earthquake alarm is always connected. This thing is always connected. The alarm clock connects once a day, for example. There is one case where open hardware played a major role. Um, and it was in the case of Fukushima when 
people in Japan did not really trust the official reports about radiation. There, then it was a whole series of different uh, individuals and hackerspaces and so on that went into creating public, publicly generated reports about radiation. And they used existing services and existing hardware. So this is an example of a circuit board made by a company, again from my hometown in Zaragoza in Spain. As you see, I'm promoting my hometown as much as I can. Go Zaragoza, tourism will save us. So, uh, but this company, they develop different sensor boards for Arduino, and one of them is this radiation sensor. It's not a scientific measuring tool, okay? It's not calibrated to give you the exact amount, but it's good enough to tell you it is dangerous to go out. You know, it will, you know, put the red flag in front of your eyes and say, shh, shh, stay home. And one of the things that we can do is that these things are usually not very cheap, is that we can inform our neighbors. How can we inform our neighbors? Just posting this thing on the internet and using existing systems like Patchway or other maps. People were posting online about the radiation at different places in Japan. You know, there were hundreds or, uh, of these kind of devices posting simultaneously. You see this. At some points, there were many more measuring points than others. This is just one example that was made with Arduino. There were other examples. Uh, and there were local examples made in Japan as well. So I'm not going to enter. This case could, could give us room to talk for probably a full hour. There was a whole discussion online about where to get radiation sensors. I mean, not, not the full kit, just this bulb that measures the radiation itself because they were out of stock everywhere in the world. So it's like there were all sorts of tricks to hack Geiger counters, radio documentation in Russian. And, you know, I know it was like a fantastic adventure for the hacker culture. Then within the arts, besides the example I showed you from Daito Manabe, there is a lot of cases. I, I've been working with this case for quite some time now. Uh, it's like a never ending story. This is uh, Stoles Stensley. He's a professor at, at uh, right now is Aalborg University in Denmark. And uh, he's very interested in haptics. And I'm not gonna show you the pictures of the kinds of things he does because you will probably get scared and you might quit the workshop, and I don't want you to leave the workshop. But, um, so you get the idea, this, this, is a, this is a vibration vest. It has 80 motors attached to this vest, 80 small, flat vibration motors, like the ones in some smartphones. And they can give you different feelings when they vibrate around your body. They can give you the feeling that there is like a snake walking, going in circles on your stomach or so on. You know, we've tried some patterns, vibration patterns that will get you seasick and eventually invite you to deliver your food back to the world. But this was made out of an Arduino Bluetooth board and a smartphone. So the, the idea is that you will walk around the city with your phone, it would detect your location, and it, once you reach a certain place, it would provoke a different vibration pattern and so on. The idea is that you will become the sculpture you were touched by people and you know reaching a certain point made you the landmark and got you to be you know yeah touched let's put it like that so at some point they had the genius idea of like okay let's make a, a bunch of jackets and go into oslo and try it out and uh, there were some people that didn't really like that uh, because you know norway and electronics on the street are not a good idea <clears throat> So a different, a different group of people that got very interested in open hardware and connectivity is uh, Google. And in 2001, Google presented the, the Android open accessory protocol that allows people to create accessories for Android devices. And the main difference to other mobile phone manufacturers or operating systems manufacturers, or however you want to call it, but for mobile phones, is that they allowed anybody to create accessories for their devices in a way that would be easy to use. I don't know how tricky this is. I haven't really sat down to analyze legal aspects behind it or anything like that. I just know that they use Arduino boards as a way to connect Android phones to the physical world. They took the Arduino reference design and they made it work with the Nexus S. So we see different cases then. Oh, well, I forgot to say something about this case. This case they presented was a connected gym. You go around with your phone, you connect to the gym, and then the gym 
gathers information about your exercising, and you can send it to the internet through your phone, for example. So that network exists only when you're there. So we, we've seen different cases than there's some cases where the objects are always connected to the network, and it's actually kind of necessary, like the radiation me measurement system. You need to know right now, because that's when you're going to leave. So you need to know now whether your street is safe or not. But the gym, you want the gym to only get your data when you're there. And when you leave, you don't really want, or at least I don't really want, that very nice looking lady to look at my statistics. I don't want her to know that my pulse rate goes bananas after 10 minutes on the you know, running meal, because I will look very bad. So that's my personal data. So, but that object is still a connected object. That gym device is still a connected device. And it's still measuring stuff, and it still connects to the internet. And I think one of the main problems we have nowadays is that the internet of things is a very broad, it's a very broad concept. Okay, it's like, it's not like very clear HTTP. This is it. This is the protocol. You know, no, no. It is about any device that connects to the internet over any medium: Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a cable, anything. And that makes it very complex to understand. <clears throat> So if you really want to build anything around the Internet of Things, then you need to consider something like this equation. Like, let's say you are an, an entrepreneur. I, I invite everybody to become an entrepreneur and try out things. But I invite you to try after making the math. You know, it's like, don't go crazy thinking that, oh, yeah, everybody are going to go into this and we'll make a Kickstarter project and then we will be rich. Like, no. You might make a Kickstarter project and have fun for a couple of months and then, you know, disappear as well. So I invite you to make this equation uh, where you should consider how many devices you want to ship, how much are you going to spend in developing the software, which is kind of documentation you're going to generate. And that gets divided by the amount of devices in order to understand how much everything is going to cost. Then you need to think about how much technical support. And the key here always is which is the kind of connectivity you're going to offer. And are you going to rely on existing infrastructure, or do, do you create your own infrastructure? A very, case, a very typical case is to think about a wireless sensor network. When you think about a wireless sensor network for your own apartment, for example, how are the objects going to connect to that network? Will, will they use Wi-Fi? Isn't Wi-Fi too expensive? Isn't it better to use Zigbee, for example? But how many of you have a Zigbee network home? Like nobody. If anybody raises the hand, I will be impressed. I will ask you for marriage. So. Are you having a Sigma network home? You see? I use the marriage thing always, as nobody says yes. So, but anyway, the whole idea is that it's, it's as complicated as anything else. You know, it's not, people think that everything is out there. Well, yeah, everything is out there, but, uh, you know, how much do you think people are willing to pay? You know, the, the, a very nice object to have would be like a fridge magnet that tells you how many likes you have on Facebook, right? if you have Facebook. Just as you feel in the morning, you will wake up and look at your fridge, get your milk, and see like 1,200 likes, like, yeah, people like me, you know? And it's like, if you're Lady Gaga, you have like two of them, ch daisy chain after the others, you can have like a million likes, you know? In my case, I just need one with one single digit. If I get two likes, like my mom and my daughter, I'm happy. But, but, um, but the, the issue here is that that device costs as much as a very complex sensor that's going to measure whether your door is open and it's going to connect to the internet you know, and allow you to open the door via SMS. Because the expensive part is the connectivity. The expensive part is not the sensor, it's not the actuator, it's the connectivity. And that's why it's ridiculous. It makes the whole ecosystem more or less impossible. So what? So, um, yeah, I usually wear my dinosaur suit when everything goes wrong. So, uh, what I'm here today for is to invite you to participate in a workshop using something that is using an obsolete technology that is GSM and GPRS. So, I guess you know that that technology, the patents have expired, which is kind of cool, which means that the hardware itself is, gets very cheap. It's an omnipresent network. It's more or less covering 99.9% .9 of Germany. It's like you can go in the toilet and there is GSM network. There may be no 3G, but there will be GSM network that I can guarantee you. And uh, you can have 
connection over those over that network to create uh, connected objects. So we have created thanks to the actually I have to now uh, thank Telefonica for their uh, involvement and collaboration. We have created a, a new type of shield, which is this one for Arduino, that will connect to the to the network and allows you to send SMS, get SMS, make a call, get a call, connect to GPRS, send data, you know, make an HTTP request to a server, post data, and so on and so forth in a very easy way. And today is the very first day we are actually like launching this from Arduino. So we have 15 sets of this equipment for people to try out uh, together with an Arduino board and so on. So we have 15 places for the workshop. Again, if you're with your very best friend and you're like this, you can join together, but you will have to share the gear. You know, you don't get two. Uh, there will be two sessions, one today and one tomorrow. And depending on how many people apply, we will make it in different ways. So if, like, if we get 50 people to apply, we'll make the same session twice. And then we will make a lottery to give away the 15 sets of equipment. If we get 20 people to apply, we will select 15 and we will make a more in-depth session. So we'll, tomorrow will be a continuation of today. You know, we are very open. It depends on how many of you are interested. And tonight it will be overnight fun. So it's like Francisco, that unfortunately is right now landing in Berlin. He couldn't make it to the presentation. And me, I'm going to stay between the workshop and tomorrow, uh, if it doesn't get too cold, working with you overnight here. So if you have like a special feature that we forgot about, we're gonna sit there and we're gonna crack the monkey and we're gonna make it happen. You know, the last time we made this workshop, we didn't sleep. There's like a lot of pictures of us like half dying with a cup of coffee for 48 hours. <clears throat> we'll be in workshop area number two. And please correct me, I think it's 2.30. It can be 2.30, yeah? Uh, as I say, it's first arriving is first served. You know, I don't care if you are cute and cozy or if you are, you know, hairy and have tattoos. It's like the first arriving, first served. And if you come 10 minutes late and there is no more room, I, will, I was going to course. I wouldn't let course. I would say bad luck. And as we say, we speak Spanish. Hola. English. Yeah. German. Ein bisschen. And uh, some Swedish. After 12 years, I can say, en café tac. Okay. So it's how it looks. I have to show the logotype of Telefonica because they're sponsoring this thing big time and they deserve all my respect, especially Francisco that will come later. And uh, I will just tell you my, my statement in life is keep your fresh eyes and keep your hands dirty. You know, this is the longest time you will hear me talking about anything. You know, 45 minutes, to one hour is my longest speech ever. The rest I do is to get dirty. Thank you. And there is time for questions, of course. Sure. If you have any question, raise your hand. Ooh, I see one. You didn't mention if these are going to be for sale and about how much they would cost the uh, GSM boards. I never say that, but <laughs> because I have no idea. But it's true; they're going to be for sale, and uh, I don't know how much they cost because I never know. I'm I'm engaged in making things, and I really don't look into. I, I know the how much they actually cost, but not how much they're going to cost. <laughs> Larger than an elephant, smaller than a bread basket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's going to be 10% less than the cheapest one you can find right now on the internet. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Hi, um, the Arduino boards, do you have any, in uh, any knowledge of them um, reaching are being used in products that are actually on the market, like commercial uh, products, uh, business to business. Um, like I'm, I'm building this robot, and mm. I'm uh, it's a service robot, and I'm planning to sell it. So, could I use it in a business application, or is it not certified? Uh, okay, the the our boards, they are CE label and FCC label. 
which uh, means as a, a part of your device, they've been certified, but you need to certify your product itself. That's how it works with certification. I mean, I, we get this question a lot. Whether it's been used in business applications, yes, because the board itself is, is a piece of hardware that is as safe as it goes. And uh, I would say the microchip itself, it's, uh, it respects military standard. The board doesn't. I mean, I've seen the board working at minus 10 degrees, but there is no warranty it's going to do it. Okay, so, um, uh, for example, the guys ship sending the balloons, they use Arduino as one of the backup systems, and as far as I know, it's the one that doesn't fail. Uh, yeah, because it has no physical parts, you know, no hard drive, no, you know, it's just a piece of, it's a microcontroller, so that thing, Probably it fails, but you don't know because it resets itself and it goes back to what it was. So that's, that's what it does. But it's used, uh, Arduino is used in, for example, uh, some projects from uh, like small uh, floats of vehicles using GPS and so on that they need to make like 20 devices. They use Arduino with GSM uh, and, GP and uh, GPS to find the devices and report back to the base station. It's used in robots, it's used in a DNA replicator, it's used in all the 3D printers, it's used at a bunch of places. The latest one is that it's used in an open source satellite project. So it's, it's used massively. People that are using it in some industrial setups, they never tell us. Because, you know, it's like I have this very funny case where I developed the code for, for Arduino to work with uh, Android devices or one of the first versions of it. I shouldn't say me only, because in open source it's really hard to, but. And, uh, and there's this company sending me this question, oh, how do you connect? Because you have this special uh, Android device, it's not a phone, it's, it's a snowflake that is a board from Ericsson. And uh, we need to change this and this. I, I give him all the information how they have to do it. And then I ask them, do you mind if I blog about your project? what your company is doing as a payback because I spent probably like seven hours support on something that has like no support because I didn't pay a euro for it. Oh no, because it's a secret, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, from now on my support is gonna based on, I am allowed to, to blog about your project. So otherwise don't ask me, you know. But we, we face this a lot of times. So we know it's used, but we can't talk about it. More questions. Uh, on the chart where you showed uh, who used uh, the Arduino, suddenly there was a huge job, uh, jump in the European population. Why is that? Yeah. Like they went from 10% to 25 or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to show the slide so that we are all on the same track. Uh, it's a good question and there is a very good explanation for that. And uh, since I am writing my doctoral thesis on the topic, I, I can tell you why that happened. So this happens because in November, November 2008, Wire Magazine published an article about do-it-yourself manufacturing featuring Arduino. Then even though Wire Magazine is a US-based publication, all the European publishers understood this might be interesting at that very moment in time. And they started publishing things in all the European media the month after. And then suddenly Europe woke up just like that. So it's, to me, it's a very clear explanation. Funny thing is that the interview was made six months before. So if they had published a thing a bit earlier, right now we would be rich. No, I was just kidding. No, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the explanation. To, at least to me, you know, I, I've been writing these statistics for seven years now. And that's the only reason I can find. Um, I have one question to say that the Internet of Things also includes uh, Plutos. Um, are there already any low energy Plutos uh, shields available or what is uh, the trend in this um, specific field? Well, Bluetooth 4 is out since um, like very little time. Um, we have a wireless shield that has 
a socket for uh, XB uh, formatted devices. And in that form factor, there exist Bluetooth 4 chips, not made by Arduino itself, but are compatible with that. So the, the answer to the question is yes, there exist by some vendors, uh, but we haven't made any official yet, but you can use it and it exists there. As a matter of fact, the, the Google ADK 2012, it has Bluetooth 4 on board, using one of the serial ports available in the chip. The only problem is that getting hold of the Google ADK 2012 is mission impossible. They only made the ones that were sold or sort of given away at Google I.O. in San Francisco this year. So there is nothing official, but whatever exists works. More questions. Thanks. When we talk about um, the Internet of Things, we should talk about LTE and the fourth generation of uh, telecommunication. And my question is, uh, I know we don't have the, the same coverage as, as GM, uh, GSM with, with uh, LTE, but uh, do you have any plans for making a shield uh, of uh, this technology? Well, when we started the mission of make... When we started the mission, I, I can talk about it. That's a signal. I believe in electronic signals. No, no, seriously said, it's like uh, when we started, or the, the process of making this shield has taken over a year time. And uh, mostly because the hard thing for us was not to make the shield, was to be able of offering people a data plan assigned to the shield. Um, I didn't speak about that, but uh, you can actually hire data through Bluevia on that shield but you're not tied up to that one. But when we did the study to make that shield, we also got prices for you know, chipsets from like every manufacturer in the world. So we have something in the pipeline, but we want to first see how much sense it makes to have this thing out. Uh, because we know for a fact, we, we've tried, I mean, we've, you know, we make Arduino Uno and Arduino Mega and Arduino, that, that, that nothing, nothing is distributed as much as Arduino Uno, nothing at all. You know, it's like probably there is like a thousand Arduino Bluetooth a year. So the question is, is it worth to have to, as an open source project, to put the amount of effort we need to put in supporting a board that only gets distributed a thousand times? The answer is no. You know, the, the clear answer is no. If you make your list of priorities, you realize that the users that are using this thing are usually power users, so they can make it themselves. And um, so the, the question is, when it comes to this kind of technology, it's going to be so expensive that I think it's going to fall in the same category. It's going to be really hard. You know, it's really hard for us even to excuse making the robot, the Arduino robot, because it's going to be fairly expensive. 100 euros is already expensive, right? But, but it's like, um, you know, it's a field we want to explore, but on the LTE side of things, it's a bit more shaky. How many people are going to use it? I don't know. You know, because right now, getting a phone, cost 50 euros. So why should you get a chipset for, you know, 70 or 80 or 90 or 100? You know, that's, that's a, yeah, it's a tricky part. The, the good thing with GSM is that you don't pay patent, patents anymore. You know, there is a lot of money when you buy a chip that, chipset that goes to the license to use the chipset. So maybe three years time. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what do you think about protocols that try to uh, rule all the thing of the stuff of the Internet of Things, like, um, for example, MQ MQTT, which I have work. Um, are you trying from Arduino to make some kind of uh, regulation or think in uh, that there must be some rules uh, attending to? Um, solve problems related to uh, the amount of devices that are supposed to be connected to the internet and the amount of data that uh, is amount to be processed. Um, well, that's a very interesting question. The, the question of protocols the is the first question that is very interesting, I think, uh, for two reasons. I mean, for me, it's very interesting because I'm right now writing a book about Arduino connected through Android, and we've chosen the kinkiest way possible, and we're going to use Arduino to talk to Android using MQTT. 
like MQTT that is meant to connect to our server structure, we are creating something called a peer-to-peer -peer MQTT, which is like a new implementation, like, you know, growing bananas. Again, MQTT is very efficient protocol-wise, but it's not so clever, probably, power-wise. If you want to do something that is power-wise very good, you should use Contiki. Uh, the question for us is like, should we be the ones deciding that? Uh, I'm not really sure. You know, we design a hardware that should be, should be uh, somehow allowing people to implement any version of, so version of software on top. That's, that's our goal. And we try to make it available to people that never really thought about using electronics before. So how to translate that to the world of sensor networks, that is what you're talking about, is something we are still not really clear how to do. So we've, what we've done is to partner with, uh, with uh, Patchway. Mostly because they offer, they use Arduino as their main system. And as you know, Patchway uses their own protocol. They don't really use MQTT, they don't really use, you know, they basically use HTTP requests to just send data and they encapsulate it in their own way and they use JSON and whatever, whatever. So the reason why we did it was not for optimal reasons from a technical point of view, we did it for optimal reasons from a user point of view. What is that the user understands? You know, and what MQTT fails with and what Contiki fails with is thinking about somebody that just got this box with 10 sensors and just want to plug them in and you know, send data directly. So the question is very tricky. So we try to focus on you know, ease of use. It's like a discussion we were having yesterday at dinner that was about writing code for people to reuse is not the same thing as writing optimal code. You know, when we write our libraries, we write them so people can hack them, not that, not that to make the best library possible. It's a completely different concept. You know, and trying to be open source implies a different way of thinking, I think, if you want people to join and collaborate. And with sensor networks, it's the same thing. So we will wait until there is a de facto standard, I think, and let people implement any of them and at some point eventually, you know, marry one. But right now, it's hard. Do you have a winner yourself? Well, uh, Contiki is a bit difficult of, of working because it's, yeah, it's, I have tried and it mm. gets a lot of time to, to understand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, I mean, Contiki is... Uh, because Contiki is very power efficient. Yeah, it's extremely. Yeah, it's, it's focused it's, on saving we power. Used, we have used for um, eight thousand and one or fourteen mm. because it's Zigbee. Yeah, yeah. For the power, we have yeah. used it. Yeah, but but then again, if you are prototyping something, how much does power mean to you? You know, if if I'm teaching electronics to a fourteen-year-old kid and helping him setting up a small wireless network, how much does power mean to this person? Nothing really. You know, that's it's something that should just work. So once that there is a really good protocol that really works fine, we will probably just take that one and make it transparent to the user. And he will or she will just see a serial port protocol and that's it. And they will not see anything else. So that's a discussion that we are not having because, you know, it doesn't really apply to our user base. Thank you. Thank you, David, for coming. David Partilla is talking about Arduino. Thank you guys for coming. We have no more time. <laughs> <laughs>